All right, Romans chapter 15. We are nearing the end of our race of Romans. Romans 15. And remember, the whole theme of the book of Romans is salvation. Paul has already completed his instruction on salvation. He's taught us about our sin and, and uh, how we need to be justified. And, and now that we've been justified, you know, he taught us how God is sanctifying us. And then uh, being sanctified, how someday we will be glorified and get a new body. He's explained how this salvation, this plan of salvation works with all God's promises for the nation of Israel. And then in chapter 12, in light of all that God has done, he began to uh, explain to us what our proper response should be to all that God has done. And so in chapter 14, Paul has begun to teach us that part of our proper response was having a proper attitude toward each other in regards to Christian liberty or our personal convictions. Remember, this is not a teaching on right and wrong, per se. This is a teaching on areas that are non-essential, areas where we can disagree and, and still be good Christians. You know, and, and, and while going through chapter 14, it was good medicine, Paul fully understands that it's not an easy easy uh, spoon of medicine to swallow. And so in chapter 15, he continues and completes this conversation by explaining that he's, we've learned that we need to get rid of pride if we're going to love one another amidst our differences in non-essentials. But, but Paul at the end here reminds us that, you know, being a loving church means we need to also put away our selfishness, not just our pride, but our selfishness too. And that'll be our focus this morning. So chapter 15, verse 1. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached you fell on me. So if we're going to be a loving church and is going to operate with, with the right attitude toward one another, we must learn to accommodate others before ourselves. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not please ourselves. Paul here identifies by saying we, he identifies with the strong ones. And remember Paul in his discussion, we got the strong ones and there are those who don't have scruples. You know, they're the one that might be able to read Harry Potter and be okay, whereas some of us cannot do that and be okay. They're the ones that might be able to say, you know, well, I can eat the food offered to idols, whereas a large group of people might be able to say, I can't do that. That's been offered to an idol. And so he says, well, I understand, you know, he said earlier in chapter um, uh, 14, verse 14, he says, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there's nothing unclean of itself. I can eat that food. It's cheap. It's, it's, that's no big problem. But he realizes that others don't see it that way. So he says, we then that are strong, the one that has the view that it's okay to do that, and it's okay to feel that way. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of those who have a scruple about that, who don't feel like that's right to do. You know, Paul says he identifies with those who are giving up a freedom to help a weaker brother. And he explains that we that are strong ought to do this. The word there ought means to be obligated or in debt. You know, well, what debt do we owe our brothers and sisters? Well, we learned it in Romans 13, verse 8. He says, owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loves another has fulfilled the law. Paul says, pay off your debts. But the only debt you'll never pay off and therefore you must keep paying is loving each other, you know? This is our motivation to do this very hard thing that God has shown us such love we could never pay him back. Therefore, we are obligated to love one another until we die. So he says here, we then that are strong are obligated to bear the infirmities of the weak. That phrase means to put on ourselves a limited capacity. We are to restrict our freedoms, to limit our freedoms in, or, in order to minister to a weaker brother or sister and not to please ourselves. The word please means to accommodate or serve. We're not to accommodate or serve ourselves. See, because we'll never be able to pay God back, we are always obligated to accommodate our weaker brethren. And we do this by taking their limited capacities on ourselves when we're around them. Verse two. So let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. You know, I love how Paul says, let every one of us, because it's just in case you think you or your situation is exempt. <laughs> he says, let every one of us Please his neighbor for good, for his good to edification. The word edification means to make someone more able, to strengthen them or build them up. 
you know? And all of our decision-making on these issues, on non-essentials, it leads to this goal. This truly is the definition of love in contrast to the opposite, which is selfishness. You may have heard it say that the opposite of love is hatred. No, not even so, because hatred can be a part of love at times. I hate it when I see horrible things on, on the news. That's a good thing. I should hate it. I shouldn't love it. Oh, a bunch of people died in a, you know, in a terrorist attack. No, I should hate that. I don't want that to happen. Last night I was praying. I was in bed praying, and I'm like, Lord, and, and you know, it's, it feels like a crazy prayer, but I just, you know, I'm like, Lord, let nobody get murdered tonight, you know? That's what I prayed. And I know we think to ourselves, you know, in all the world, you know, how is that going to happen? But I, I just, God, I mean, I know you can do it, you know, and, and there's an awareness in my heart that I know that if God stops them, he has to stop everybody, and really then just judgment comes, and we all dead, you know? But I pray, God, just, you know, let it not be tonight, you know? We should hate wrong. So the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness because love is for someone else. Selfishness is for me, you know? And in this, Jesus is our example. For even Christ did not please or accommodate or serve himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached you fell upon me. Now, the word reproaches there refers to insults or mocking. And so Paul, this is actually a quote from Psalm 69, verse 9, the end part of it. I don't have time to go through the whole psalm today, but Psalm 69 is a messianic psalm that references the false accusations that would come against the future Messiah and their mocking of him on the cross, you know? And sometimes we don't want to accommodate a weaker Christian because, well, I don't want to be associated with whatever they're hung up on, you know? Well, if they can't go to the movie theater, well, that, tough cookies for them. I'm going to see the new, you know, Captain America. You know, we get hung up because, like, I don't want to be associated with someone who's got that kind of a personal conviction. You know, yet Jesus, <laughs> he was associated with all sorts of wrong perceptions on our behalf, wasn't he? You know? And he did so with a joy in his heart because he knew the benefits his loving sacrifice would bring to us. For the joy that was set before him, it says he endured the cross and despised its shame. Paul echoes this mindset in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Would you turn there with me? Just one book to the right. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul actually spends quite a few chapters talking about this same topic to the Corinthians because they had pride and selfishness issues too. And so in verses 31 and 33, he closes out his teaching to them on this topic by saying these words. Chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, verse 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God and give none offense. And so as you're doing it, give no offense, neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God. So anybody else. Even as, and he says, I'm your example in this. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. See, Paul's heart is that he would accommodate himself. You know, he says, to the Jews I became as a Jew. To the Gentiles I became as a Gentile. When he was around the Jews, he liked bacon. You know, but he thought, well, they're not going to eat it though, so I'm not going to flaunt it in front of them. Now, when he was hanging out with the Gentiles, he enjoyed the bacon, you know? But when he was around the Jewish people, he said, no, none of that, you know, because I don't want to offend them needlessly. That's a bad reason to offend somebody, you know? So Paul says, I accommodated myself to the weaker brother when I was around them so I could be a blessing to them and that they would benefit from it and we should do the same. Because here's the truth. God knows you're accommodating yourself to that weaker Christian out of love. He knows that. So no one else needs to know it, you know? Like Jesus, we need to endure through a hard thing, not exercising our freedom in an area of our lives, in the expectation that God will reveal all clearly when we stand before Kim. So number one, we must accommodate ourselves. If we're going to be a loving church, we must accommodate ourselves to the weaker brothers and sisters. Secondly, we need to keep our eyes on the prize. Verse four, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. See, here we see that Paul is encouraging us. He says, listen, whatever things were written, and he's referring to the quote he makes from Psalm 69. So it tells us that Jesus endured things for us. He didn't accommodate himself, but he accommodated us in our weakness. So these things that we were written beforehand, he says they were written for our learning. They were written for our benefit. That we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. 
See, it's God's word that empowers us to keep our eyes on the prize. You know, it's becoming a common theme in churches today to ignore the Old Testament. Um, in fact, uh, there's a whole movement in the church today that says we shouldn't even, we have no business even teaching or studying the Old Testament at all. Paul and the other New Testament writers didn't have that opinion. They taught us otherwise. They said, you need this stuff because it's the scriptures that enable us to have hope. And the New Testament scriptures weren't completed yet. So he's referencing the Old Testament scriptures. So it's through the, the, the God's word as we're spending time in it that it empowers us and instructs us to keep our eyes in the prize that we with through patience and comfort might have hope. The patience and comfort comes from his word. You know, patience means fortitude, endurance, steadfastness. It means a stick to that you hang in there. We hang in there and we're comforted through the scriptures that we might have hope. See, we might read Paul's words and think, well, this doesn't sound fair. Paul doesn't address that issue because fairness isn't the issue. Love is the issue. I hear all the time, you know, people, you know, Christians uh, get upset. You know, you'll see a post on Facebook about, you know, oh, I can't believe it. Somebody at work today said my, shirt, my skirt was too short. I might stumble other believers, you know. And, and just the fact that you're going public about that shows a selfishness there. You know, because usually that's accompanied by these words. It's none of their business what I wear. Get their eyes off my legs or something like that, you know. So the idea behind it, I, and they do need to get their eyes off your legs. But the idea behind it, though, is that I really don't care what how I do affects other people. And that's selfish. And the way you write it, that's selfish. And it should not be our heart and our attitude towards our brothers and sisters. We should not despise the weaker brother. That's what the Bible says to the strong in chapter 14. Don't despise the weaker brother. You know what? Rather, it says find ways that you can be a blessing and build them up, you know? You know, when we read that it was prophesied long ago that Christ would behave this way, it gives us strength to endure and it comforts us as we restrict our freedoms. God's word empowers us to endure and it provides comfort for the sacrifices we make. And we can't live this out in action or attitude if we're not in the word. I frequently find those that who cry not fair are also those who don't have a very steady walk with the Lord. They don't have a regular time with an open Bible at the feet of Jesus. You know, it's very hard to complain when you're reading about the one who gave up everything for you, isn't it? You know, I can't believe they made that comment about me. I'm a good Christian. I love you, Lord. But then you open up the word, you see he was beaten and bruised for our iniquities. He was wounded for our transgressions. It puts everything in perspective, doesn't it? You know, are you in the word regularly? It's the only way we're going to be a loving church as individuals, to be a loving church as a conglomerate. The only way we're going to do that is by being in the word as individuals regularly so he can form us and shape us into what he wants us to be, that we might have that endurance. We might have that comfort even when we're sacrificing things for others. And as a result, through that, we might have hope, it says here in verse four. Hope means to look forward with a confident expectation. See, the truth is some days, all these differences we have, they won't exist. All the misunderstandings will be cleared up and all accusations will be exonerated. And if limiting my freedom results in a weaker Christian being strengthened in their faith, then I think I can wait until heaven to have that cleared up, don't you? I can wait until get, I get to heaven and people think to me, yeah, hey, that Pastor Will, he was real restrictive in his beliefs. I think he was kind of legalistic. And then, you know, get to heaven and they go, oh, you were doing that for other people. I think I can wait for that. So, so can you. Now, having exhorted us to this mindset, Paul prays for God to empower us to do it. For without him, we can do nothing. Verse five. Now, the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. See, if we're gonna keep our eyes on the prize, it's God's character that empowers us to be like Jesus, to keep our eyes on that prize. You know, fortitude and comfort aren't things we find in and of ourselves. Their source is God and he gives them to us as we are in his word. You know, and this also shows us that we gain an accurate understanding of God's character through the scriptures. It's truly how we know him. And in light of that, he says that God would enable us to be like-minded one toward another in the same way Jesus was toward us. Now, I guarantee you that Jesus is not conforming himself to your personal convictions or opinions. <laughs> so what does it mean to be like-minded here? It means to think the same thing. And yet we've already learned we're not thinking the same thing in personal convictions, but rather this is referring to thinking the same thing toward each other in our heart toward each other. And this Jesus does have, and he wants us to be in agreement with him. And this applies therefore to both the weaker and the stronger Christian, that we're to love one another, that we're to treat one another with dignity and respect, even in our differences. Well, how do we do that? 
Well, it means you have loving conversation about these things. See, what often happens is we devolve into angry conversation, right? <laughs> I can't believe, I can't believe you're letting your kids go to public school. How, why would you do that? You know, and then you get into this big nasty argument and now someone's sitting over here and someone's sitting over there and they don't talk to each other anymore, right? You know, I wasn't pointing to anyone in particular, so <laughs> just so you know, so. Or maybe I was. You know, having loving conversation, what does that look like? Well, the, I, I was reading one of my commentaries and it said there's five ways that you can relate to the stronger or weaker brother when you have a difference. So the first way is, I can't do that and I struggle if you do, to have that kind of a conversation. So, you know, maybe the best thing in that type of situation is not to engage, you know, in all, like I don't, there's certain things that I don't talk to other people about. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not being honest with you. I just know you probably can't handle all me, you know? That's the truth of it. Just like there's some, some things that I realize, you know, I might not be able to handle all you, you know? So I, I realize that. I recognize that in my heart that I don't, I'm not really allowed to be necessarily free with all my thoughts and ideas, you know? And especially behind a pulpit, I have to be really careful because some of those things, you defend somebody over a non-essential, which is not good. It's not Christ, you know? On the same token, maybe there's something you struggle with, you know, and, and, and so you can't do it. And I have to be careful, you would have to be careful around that, you know, I mean, someone would have to be careful around you. You know, I always appreciate it when someone says to me, says, uh, hey, Pastor Will, you know, we might have dinner and say, you mind if I, you know, order a glass of wine? And I'll turn to him and say, I don't have a problem with that. If the Lord's okay with it with you, that's fine. But, you know, I, I won't. I don't struggle with that. But there might be people who do. Rather than just ordering it and just not caring, it shows great love when you look at that person and go, you know, I will do this sometimes. Are you okay with that? Or maybe have a conversation even beforehand with them just to find out. You know, on the other hand, of just, you know, putting dinner in front of them, inviting them over, and then cracking open a beer, you know, and then they're just looking like, what do I do now, you know? So I can't, and I struggle if you do, having that conversation. Number two, I can't, but you can. That's where I would fall in regards to alcohol. You could put a thousand bottles or whatever in front of me. I'm just never going to be stumbled. The stuff, you know, just stinks to me. I just, they smell it and it's nasty. The, I don't have any temptation whatsoever to have it, okay? That's me. Realize other people might not be that way, but that's me. You know, on the other hand, if you put a bunch of dessert in front of me, yeah, I am going to struggle. <laughs> so I can't, but you can. And having that conversation where you know, hey, this is okay, it's no big deal, you know. Then you have, I can, like, I'm not bothered by that, I can do that, but it is a struggle for me, so I don't. So in other words, then, maybe it's not a good idea for you to do it in a mixed setting, you know. So like in that situation, it's like, well, I have no problem. I understand I'm free in Christ to do this, but I, I struggle. I, I start to get tempted if, if I'm in an environment where it's like that. So, you know, I realize there's nothing wrong with it, but I just, and when I'm around it, I struggle. So maybe we shouldn't do that. And having that conversation. Then number four, I can, and you can. I have no scruples with it. You don't have any scruples with it. We can be free. And you know, there are folks that are like that. There are folks that, I, that come over the house that I've known them for years. I know all the in and outs about them. We've had all the conversations about every little nook and cranny of, you know, Christian ideology or thought process on anything. And I know where they stand and I feel free, you know, I feel free to do it, you know. A good example I shared at last service is, is television. There are some people who can't have a television, you know. Barely when we, when we, when we got a, a larger TV, because I like sports and I like it on a larger, you know, viewing, so. And, uh, you know, she wanted to be able to close it because she knows that, but she's not a big TV person and she also knows other people are not, you know, not on it. So the idea to be able to close it and get it away. So I like that, but let me tell you where I can't go. We don't have cable. And here's why. Because like, since I was a little kid, if the TV was on, I'm watching it. It didn't matter if it was WWF or CNN News or some movie or My Little Pony cartoon. If it's on, for some reason, I'm going to be glued to it, okay? So we don't have that because I would waste a lot of time. When we go to people's houses who have cable, you know, Beverly tells me, she's like, please don't grab the remote. <laughs> because she knows what will happen. I am a sports junkie. And so I, and you know, if someone has ESPN and ESPN, Cla ESPN Classic, I'm a sports nerd. So in addition to liking sports, ESPN Classic is like drugs for me, you know? <laughs> it's like, you know, not, you know, you know, I'll be on that. I remember this one time we were at her cousin's house and, and she's like, what are you watching? I'm like, it's the 1973 Sugar Bowl. <laughs> and she just looked like, what, why? And I'm like, cause it's the, never mind. 
But I do, I get glued to that thing. So like at the hotel, I don't touch it, you know? I stay away from the thing. The kids wanna watch it, that's fine, I'm okay. But if I get a hold of it, I'm gonna start traipsing through until I find something I like. Oh, great, and then when that's done, I'll keep going, you know? And lo and behold, the next Saturday, at, you know, or the next day morning at Disney, I'm a zombie because I stayed up till 4 a.m. watching the Sugar Bowl from 1942. Which brings me to the last point. I can, but I won't because others might be stumbled. And you know, I know I've used the, the alcohol thing a lot um, here, but let me share a word of advice to you. The Bible, I've said the Bible has a lot more to say about that. Even if I wasn't a pastor and even if I didn't hate alcohol, I'd probably never touch the stuff in public because I don't know who's watching and I don't know who's struggling. And it's one of those things that can be so sensitive that you have to be really careful, you know? that I've taken the viewpoint, it wouldn't bother me at all, but I'm not, I would never do that because I would never want to stumble another brother or sister in the Lord. And there's a lot of things in life that I've done that with where I've just made the choice. I can, I don't have a problem with that, but you know what? I'm not going to because I just never want somebody to grab it. It was funny, uh, when I taught the youth group years ago, they came over the house one day and I'm, I love to read. And I'm a huge, I'm confess a little bit here, I'm a huge Tom Clancy fan. Okay, love all the history novels and stuff, particularly the older ones, specifically in the Cold War era and stuff. Problem is, he can get a little risque. I actually stopped reading them as he got later on because he got real risque. Well, I had one, you know, uh, some little you know book down there, and, and all the youth came over and they saw it and they thought, oh, Pastor Will loves shooting people up and you know, in the in all the Tom Clancy video games. And I was like, time out. I do not do that, okay? <laughs> I like a good story, all right? I don't like killing people, all right? At least not usually. So, you know, I had to explain, and I realized, you know, probably not a wise idea to leave it on the coffee table, you know? And I saw, you know, there's some things I've stopped doing because I just, I don't ever want to stumble anybody. I don't ever want to cause anybody to have a hardship because of my, my freedom, you know? So to sum it up, you can disagree on areas of Christian liberty, but you can't be divergent in your attitude toward one another. We must always follow the example of Jesus because at the end, we're not living for the here and now. We're living for something greater. Verse six, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when we keep our eyes in the prize and we live out like Jesus, God is glorified. Now, it's interesting because the phrase there, we may, that we may with one mind and one mouth glorify God. It's subjunctive, which means, is a, is a uh, mood in the Greek, which means it's possible not to glorify God by not doing this. That we as Christians might not glorify God if we don't do this. You know, and I see it around the, the church, unfortunately, the church, greater church, because we're known more for our disagreements than our agreements sometimes, we're not glorifying God. We're dishonoring God. You know, even though we have disagreements on personal convictions, what we're known for should not be those disagreements, but the loving attitude and loving speech others see and hear us have toward one another. That's how we glorify God. And you know, remember at the end of the day, it says here that we might glorify God, even the father of our Lord, the master, Jesus Christ. Our captain is Jesus, not ourselves. So I don't need to accommodate myself. I'm, do, I'm on the team to accommodate our captain, who's the one who accommodated us as our example. And so in verse seven, Paul comes full circle from when he started the discussion. In chapter 14, verse one, he says, him that is weak in the faith, welcome him. And so here in chapter 15, verse seven, he says, wherefore, here's my conclusion, welcome, receive one another as Christ also has welcomed us to the glory of God. Let me ask you a question. How did Jesus welcome us? And we came and we said, Lord, I want, I want to be forgiven of all my sins. I want, to, I want to follow you. I want you to be my savior. Did he say, well, we need to talk about Harry Potter and we need to talk about homeschooling or public schooling and we need to talk about alcohol. I mean, is that what he did? No. We came to him in repentance and faith and he received us to himself, right? So here's the question. If that's how Jesus receives us, then we need to welcome believers the same and not make them get all their scruples in line with mine. Now, there would still be the danger of thinking, well, how are we supposed to pull this off? Particularly the church at Rome, as they're hearing this, they're probably thinking, Paul, don't you realize how differently us Jews and Gentiles see things? Paul did, but more importantly, so did God. See, his plan to unite all these different people groups who were very different around Jesus was from the beginning. And, and that's the idea. 
He's uniting us not around our scruples, not around our personal convictions. He's uniting us around Jesus. He is our common ground, verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. Here we see that, remember why Jesus came, which is the third way that we're going to be a loving church. We need to accommodate one another. We, you know, we need to keep our eyes on the prize. And then lastly, we need, must remember why Jesus came. It says here that he came as a minister of the circumcision. He came to be a servant to the Jewish people. It says for the truth of God. Literally means for the sake of the truth of God. In other words, there were promises and prophecies in God's word that were given to the Jewish people. And because of that, Jesus had to be born as a Jew and he had to come to minister to the Jewish people. But in doing so, he was also serving the Gentiles. Verse nine. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. See, the phrase there, and the Gentiles, attaches to the word minister in verse 8. It's like he's saying, now I say that Jesus Christ was a servant of the circumcision, but also of the Gentiles. So the idea here is that he served both. And you know, Jesus had such an interesting ministry for his day and age. Because while primarily serving the Jewish people, he also made it clear that his ministry had extensions to all of mankind. Remember when the woman, uh, I think she was from, uh, she was a Sidonian woman, I believe and her daughter was demon-possessed, and Jesus was up in that area of Tyre and Sidon, and, and he was walking, and she's crying out, Hail, son of David, have mercy upon me, because she wanted him to heal her daughter. And the disciples are going, Oh, this Gentile woman, she just won't shut up. Can Jesus, can you tell her to go away? And so Jesus turned to her, you know, and, and, and he said to her, he said, I'm, I'm not but called to the lost sheep of Israel. Ooh, talk about a smackdown. You're like, lady, I'm here to minister to the Jews. Well, the Bible says she fell down before him. She put away the Jewish ruse, you know, pretending I'm Jewish, you know. Hail, son of David was a Jewish term, not a Gentile term. But she fell down on her face before him and she said, you know, he said, I'm not come but to minister the lost sheep of Israel. It's not right to give the puppies the food that's on the table. And so she fell down before him and she said, oh, but Lord, even the puppies get some scraps. And the Lord's heart was so touched by that. And he said to her, he said, daughter, <laughs> Your little girl is going to be healthy. You know, remember the centurion? He said, I've not found such great faith. No, not in all Israel. That made some people mad. <laughs> Jesus in John chapter 10, he actually explained that he was not just here to save the Jewish people, but he was here to save all mankind. He said, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and am known of mine. As the father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And he explains who they are. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also must I bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. See, from the beginning, God knew he was bringing people who were different together into one group. He was unifying them, you know, together. He knew there'd be different ideas, different ways of approaching life in these non-essential areas, but he brought them together anyway. Now, to prove this isn't some new teaching Paul's invented, Paul quotes four Old Testament passages which promised God would do this. He says here, as it is written, verse 9 in Romans 15, For this cause I will confess to you among the Gentiles and sing unto your name. That's from Psalm 18, which is also from a psalm David wrote in 1 Samuel, I want to say 22. And then verse 10, he quotes from Moses in Deuteronomy 32. And again he says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. Verse 11, this is a quote from Psalm 117. It's only got two verses, one of the shortest chapters in the whole Bible. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and laud him, all you people. And then verse 12, the big one. And again, Isaiah said, there shall be a root of Jesse. That's referring to the Messiah. And he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. See, this was prophesied. It was God's plan from the very beginning to place two very different people groups together who would be united by his love and the essentials of the faith. And if that's the case, then it's okay if we approach non-essentials differently because that means it's part of God's plan too. And now, our issues today are not Jew and Gentile. In fact, most of us here are dirty Gentiles. We've got a few Jewish folks here. But most of us are Gentiles. But you know what? We aren't clones of one another, even as Gentiles. And God is using us in unique neighborhoods, unique work environments, and unique families. So how about we let one another do so by loving one another, even when we disagree on these non-essentials? You know, instead of having critical eyes on each other's personal convictions, let's exercise love and get our eyes in the prize. Verse 13. 
Now the God of hope, he returns back to this topic of we're, we're hoping, we're looking forward to something else. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing as you're trusting him so that you might overflow in hope, abound in hope. You might have more than enough hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. See, our hope isn't in every Christian seeing personal convictions our way. Our hope is in spending eternity with him, amen? That's where we're going. That's the prize, you know? So, you know, that we're a part of those Gentiles who are worshiping Jesus as he reigns forever and ever. We sang about that song, right? Forever he is glorified, forever he is lifted high, you know? Someday we're gonna stand before him and be with him. That's our goal, you know? And as we wait for that expectation to happen, Paul's prayer should be ours, that the God of that hope that we have would fill us with joy. The word there means to fill up to the brim with all kinds of joy and peace, as we trust in him, that we might overflow in hope through the power of God's spirit. Doesn't that sound like a church you want to be at? <laughs> That's my heart for our church. Is it yours? You know, one reason we celebrate the Lord's Supper is to remind ourselves what matters most. And as we spend some time examining ourselves today, I want to encourage you, you need to make sure that you're right in every wrong attitude you have towards another believer. You know, we used to have a thing at, at, at school when we would take the Lord's Supper is that if you don't have it right with somebody here on campus, you need to go make it right before you take the Lord's Supper. And I'm not gonna make you do that because that can be kind of public. Um, but I wanna encourage you. We're gonna have the worship team come up now and, and as they do so, and we spend some time reflecting on all the Lord suffered for us, as we do so, if you know you're not right with somebody here in the congregation, or maybe they're not in our congregation, maybe it's a brother or sister who's, who's outside of the congregation, I want to encourage you, tell the Lord, say, Lord, I'm going to make this right. And in doing so, when as soon as possible, you follow through with that and make it right. Amen? Well, maybe you're here today and, and you're visiting this morning, or, or maybe you're, you're not a Christian, and, and I would ask you, do you have this kind of love for those that you, dis, you disagree with? You know, I'm always intrigued by the fact that when tragedy strikes, um, you know, you see the, the, the rallying cry for love conquers hate. Um, but you know, I, what I realized is actually hate conquers hate because what you see, that's what they're saying because they hate the people who hate <laughs> and they're going to overcome their hatred by, by saying, you're not going to beat us. And so we're going to hate you, you know, but that's not what Jesus did, you know? So do you have this kind of love for those you disagree with? Do you accommodate yourself to those you disagree with, you know, on matters that aren't life and death, right or wrong? Now, if your response is, that's not fair, why do I have to accommodate myself? If that's what you're thinking in your heart, then I, can I ask why you feel that way? In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus, when talking about this different kind of love, the love that he has, the love that his followers should have, the love that good people should have, which we don't, of course, because there's none good. He says, you have heard that it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? Because then, he says, you might be the children of your father which is in heaven. Because that's how he loves. For he makes his son to rise on, on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love them which love you, then what reward do you have? Do not even the worst people, the publicans, do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, then what are you doing more than others? Don't even the worst of people, the publicans, do the same? Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. So let me ask you this morning, have you been perfect like your creator? Have you loved like your creator? Well, the truth is no one has. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of that standard, the glory of God. But John 3.16 says that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, if you will recognize that, that your love isn't enough, that you need God's love in your life, that you, your way isn't a good way, that you're a part of that, all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. If you'll repent, it means to change your mind, to agree with God that the way you've been going isn't okay, and that you want to put your faith in Christ and trust in him to be forgiven and trust in him to fill you with his love that you might please God with the way that you live. If you'll do that today, the Bible says God will forgive you completely and make you his child. Won't you come to the one who is love that he might change your heart? Let's pray. 
Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us, that you are example that when we were without strength, you died for us, Lord, that when we were still sinners, you died for us. And Lord, we thank you for that. We wanna extend that same grace and love and mercy to one another. So Lord, if there's anybody right now that we've got at odds with, Lord, that we've been holding back from because we're angry at them or we had that disagreement and and now we're frustrated with that person, Lord, we we confess that to you as sin and we don't wanna do that anymore. We wanna love like you love that the whole world would know that we are yours. And every eye closed, every head bowed. Maybe you're here today and, 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 and you don't know the Lord and you, you've, you've tried to love on your own. You've tried to, you tried to be good on your own, but you realize this morning it's, it's not enough. That it's not, it's not the way God standard is. And you wanna turn from doing things your own way and you wanna put your faith in Christ, believe that he died on the cross for your sins. If you wanna do that today, just lift your hand up high. I'd love to pray with you. If there's anybody this morning that you'd love to, to ask the Lord Jesus to come into your heart, to come into your life, to forgive you of all your sin, just lift your hand high before we take the Lord's Supper today. Anybody before we do that this morning? Oh Lord, we thank you so much for your great salvation. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.